I'd like you to open up your Bibles this morning to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that we were Gentiles carried away by those dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today for your word again, especially as we Uh, delve into uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14 in this series of messages. We'd ask, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to understanding your word, that we not be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and that, Lord, you would give us from your word, not only knowledge, but discernment, as we consider uh, spiritual giftedness within the body of Christ, we pray. In Christ's precious name, amen. Well, if there was ever a section of Scripture that has created more controversy and misinterpretation within the church in modern times, I frankly don't know what it is. And for me, even more disturbing is the rejection, I think, of solid, a solid hermeneutic of the passage for some sort of ecstatic experience. I remember a number of years ago, probably now, I guess over 40 years ago, uh, I was uh, working in a factory, a new believer, I'd been saved maybe a year, and uh, I got into a discussion with an individual about speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts. And I had just finished studying this section at some length, and the reason for it is I had been exposed uh, to uh, the charismatic viewpoint by a number of different individuals in my life who were trying to convert me over. Now that you're saved, you need this. And I want to just say, anybody who tells you that, who says, now that you're saved, you need something else, walk away. I don't care what it is, you walk away. Because it doesn't center on the person of Christ. And so I got into this study, and so I'm sharing 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 with this individual. And it took two or three days. We would do this at lunchtime. We'd go through a section, and then we'd come back to it. When we got all done, here's what he said to me. He says, well, I can't argue your interpretation of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, but all I know is that I spoke in tongues, and that's good enough for me. Do you see what's happened here? We've elevated our personal experience over the very word of God. Now, as we go through this passage, I just want to say this, make it extremely clear. There are a great many in our circles, and you'll hear me say this a couple of times through this series, that will say, well, God can do anything. So I'm not going to limit him on the issue of speaking in tongues. And I'm going, that's a coward's way out. Let me answer that today, and I will answer it a couple more times in order to drive the point home over the next number of weeks. Yes, God can do anything except lie and contradict his word. And so when it comes to his word, if the word of God says a certain thing regarding spiritual gifts, God will not contradict that. And as we will see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, certain gifts that we call sign gifts or temporary gifts or apostolic gifts 
did disappear from the scene, and they did, according to 1 Corinthians, end. So therefore, some gifts do end, while others continue on. The problem here is that when we're talking about spiritual giftedness in this whole area in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, much of what we see today is not only elevating of an experience over Scripture, but it's also a denial of sola scriptura, which means Scripture only. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was a very strong, charismatic fella. Uh, he and I got along wonderfully. But he was at least honest. He's the only person I've ever heard say this. Yes, the charismatic movement does believe in extra biblical revelation. Well, of course they do, because tongues would be considered extra biblical revelation. A word of wisdom would be considered an extra, extra uh, revelation, biblical, over the scripture. A word of knowledge would have been considered um, extra biblical revelation. Prophetic utterances would be considered extra biblical revelation. Anybody in the New Testament, any New Testament church or any pastor says, I have a word of God from God that's apart from this word, run. Leave him. He is a false prophet. I don't know how stronger I can say that. The problem here is they believe in extra-biblical revelation. It's a denial of everything that we know regarding the authority of God's word. The whole Reformation was built on sola scriptura. We would not know about justification by faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone, if it was not for sola scriptura. And even worse... It's a misrepresentation of the scripture plus whatever else. Now the Corinthian church, like much of the church today, was seriously affected by counterfeiting as well as by misunderstanding and misuse of spiritual gifts. And so the apostle Paul continues to answer the question about which Paul had already written about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where he's answering questions from letters. He says, now concerning the things which you wrote me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, etc., etc. The point here is that he had received two separate letters, and we discussed this earlier. And in these letters came questions. And so the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians is answering those. That's why you find 1 Corinthians taking large sections of Scripture, sometimes two and three chapters, in order to answer it. We talked about liberty in Christ. That was three whole chapters. We talked about carnality, the first three chapters. And now we're going to be talking about, then we talked about uh, abuse in the Lord's table, which was two chapters. And then we look, we're now looking at the abuse of spiritual gifts in chapters 12, 13, and 14. Judging by the apostles' teaching in this section, the questions that would have been included, that obviously would have been included, are what are the spiritual gifts? How many of them are there? Does every believer have them? How can a person know which one he has? How important are the individual Christian uh, are are they to individual Christian living and to the life of the church? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how does it relate to spiritual gifts? Are all the gifts given for every age of the church or were some given only for a special purpose and for a limited time? And can the gifts be counterfeited? And if so, can believers tell the true ones from the false ones, we're going to answer all of those. Every one of those questions. So just as the Corinthians, 
had perverted almost everything else, they also had perverted the nature, purpose, and use of spiritual gifts. And although they had a rich and complete, and they were rich and complete in spiritual gifts, you can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7, they lacked none of the gifts in the church. They were poor in understanding them and irresponsible in using them. Now, a lot of this is because of their pagan background. And I was going to spend a lot of time on here. I'm not going to today, but I'd like to give you some information so that you at least get an idea here. This perversion, as the others, was largely due to the ideas and practices that they had literally dragged in from their pagan society into the church. They'd synchronized their pagan religion with Christianity. This is not uncommon. The Roman Catholic Church is a synchronization of Roman mystery religions, Greek and Roman mystery religions, into Christianity, and we end up with the Roman Catholic Church. The pagan cults of Greece and Rome were part of what are commonly called the mystery religions. They now had dominated Near Eastern, the Near Eastern world for thousands of years. And so they were a dominant force within the cultures of the Near East. And indirectly would dominate much of Western culture through the Middle Ages and to some extent even today. Several pagan practices were especially influential in the Church of Corinth. And perhaps the most important and certainly the most obvious was what they called ecstasy. Now that's not the drug, but rather it is a philosophy of, of religion. What it considered was, was considered to be the highest expression of religious experience. It was always based on some sort of supernatural emotional experience that the believer or that the person uh, has practiced or experienced. It was considered then a supernatural experience and often was quite bizarre and would have appealed to the natural man. Now, you don't have to go very far in our culture to see that it's still going on. There are churches out there. We have churches in the Seattle area like this. Being drunk in the spirit. And there's one guy out there that talks about that. And if, if you ever find that guy, go somewhere else. He isn't a believer. Or people all over the floor in convulsions. Self-induced. Or being slain in the spirit, which isn't even found in scripture, and a number of other very bizarre things. These all come from the occult. They don't come from the word of God. And this was true in Corinth. Ecstatic experiences. And because the Holy Spirit had performed many miracles, in the apostolic age, some Corinthian Christians confused those true wonders with the false wonders counterfeited in what was considered the ecstasies of paganism. Now, the Greek word ecstasy is ekstikeia, a term not used in scripture, by the way, was held to be a supernatural and sensuous communion with a deity and often involved immorality. And through frenzied, hypnotic chants and ceremonies, worshipers experience semi-conscious, euphoric feelings of oneness with their god or goddess. And one of those was ecstatic tongues. So even in pagan cultures, one of the key things was what they called ecstatic tongues, or babbling. 
The church at Corinth, one of the chief evidence of spiritual immaturity was that the church just lacked discernment. And that's an important thing to understand. How does, a, how does an individual or how does a group of believers lack discernment? The answer is very simple. You have not disciplined yourself solely to the word of God. You've looked elsewhere and elevated those things over the very word of God. So if occult practices seem to have a supernatural effect, it was assumed that they were from God. Now, look, I had this happen to me over and over again. I'd like to just illustrate it with something that really was very upsetting. We had an individual in the church at the time who had kind of wandered off. I hadn't seen him for a while, and then he came back, and then he wanted to go out on visitation with me, so I took him out. And we were in a home, and I was sharing the gospel with somebody. It was obvious this person was not going to receive Christ. They were argumentative and everything else. And all of a sudden, this friend of mine popped up and said, look, it's for real. And then he just started babbling in front of a lost person. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, will they not think you are mad? I was very upset. I was more upset than the people in that home, and they were very upset. This does nothing to advance the gospel or the glory of God. Just because you have some sort of ecstatic experience does not prove anything. It's just kind of like the My Pillow guy when he advertises his book. He says, "Well, I like to prove it through mathematics." And just exactly how do you do that? It's called the ontological argument, but it doesn't prove it. It just merely says that the odds are in favor that there is a deity. The Bible is a self-attesting book. It witnesses its own scripture. It does not need our help. And there were other things, such as if a priest or soothsayer performed a miracle, they assumed it was by God's power. I want to just suggest to you that demonic forces are fully capable of performing miracles. They appear, as the scripture says, as angels of light in 2 Corinthians 10. And so if someone demonstrated some supernatural gift, then they thought it just must be from God. They just lacked discernment. So if a person speaks in an ecstatic tongue, it must be from the Holy Spirit. On what grounds? Especially if the pagan religions already had ecstatic ecstatic tongues. And you need to understand this. All the major cults in America speak in tongues. All of them. And like many Christians today, they believe that if something works, it must be right and good. That that is the essence of pragmatism. So in answer to the questions put before Paul in letters, Paul tells them how to determine what was of the Holy Spirit and what is not of the Holy Spirit. The point of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 is corrective and to give discerning guidance guidance as to what is real and what is true. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 says this, 
Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test the spirits. How do we test the spirits? By comparing it with the word of God. What does the word of God say? Now there's um, three books that I'd like to recommend to you that you might find interesting and, and good books. They're, all three of them are written by John MacArthur. One of them is called The Charismatics. Uh, the next one is called Charismatic Chaos. And the third one is called Strange Fire. They're all excellent books. I think the middle book is more entertaining than it is uh, solidly theological. It is theological. It's just got a lot more um, examples of false uh, teaching. Uh, and in that book, uh, he talks about a missionary. His name was Percy. Now, I had some experience with this because there was a number of articles in the Seattle Times at the time, the many, many years ago, about 45 years ago, about this fella. Maybe not quite that long, 35 years ago. And he was a missionary, and he had come home and um, he fell ill, and he died. And he went to heaven on the Holy Ghost elevator. And when he was in heaven, he saw Jesus building houses for aborted babies. And this kind of stuff went on and on. It was unbelievable. And that Abraham was teaching the aborted babies biblical truth because he is the father of faith. None of this, of course, is found in the scripture. But what these guys do, and what this fellow did, is he would quote a passage of scripture or a portion or a part of a scripture. And then the article would go on and they would interview people and they'd say, oh yeah, yeah, this is, he's great. You know, everything he says is found in the Bible. No, everything he said is perverted from the Bible. There's no exegesis taking place here. There's no hermeneutic here, no study of the word of God in a historical context and a literal context. I remember a number of years ago, on the radio, a gal got on and says, the Christian church teaches that you, that teaches reincarnation. And I'm going, what? And I'm mumbling to myself, it's appointed unto man who wants to die after that, the judgment. No, she didn't use that passage. Guess which passage she used? John 3, 3, you must be born again. Do you understand where we're going with this? And this is the type of thing that is going on in evangelicalism all the time. A lack of honesty with the word of God and a lack of discernment within the body of Christ because we are not disciplining ourselves to the word of God. We, if someone comes across with some miraculous event, then it must be of God. That's the, the answer to everything. I could go on and on and give you a number of uh, illustrations that I have personally experienced. Some of them are downright frightening. All of them I found very upsetting simply because these folks ignored the word of God. So, I'm giving you all this information. We'll go into this in greater detail, but understand this. If someone comes to you and says they're a prophet, if someone comes to you and says they're an apostle, if someone comes to you and says, I'd like to help you speak in tongues, here's what you do. Run. None of that has any biblical foundation. And the internet right now, because of COVID-19, is littered with this stuff, especially so-called prophets. Stay away from them. 
Ground yourself in God's word. The Apostle Paul here, in the very first part of this passage, says this, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, verse 1 through 3, I do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Paul wants to make sure that the Corinthians have a clear and complete understanding of spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. The particular, when you look at that, and by the way, this is important that you see this, especially as we get into this section. You'll notice in your King James or New King James Bibles, it, the word gifts is an italic. It's an italic because it doesn't appear in the Greek. What appears in the Greek is the word spiritual, pneumakotis. And it what that and it comes to, and that particular word pneuma means breath or spirit. And what this particular Greek word is trying to say here, what Paul is saying regarding spirituals, doesn't use the word gift. I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, when you get to verse 4, if you look down there to verse 4, we're not going to be preaching from that, but notice verse 4, the word gift is not in italics, and you want to get over down through uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and then again over in 1 Corinthians 14, you'll see that gifts is not in italic. The word gift there is charisma. Totally different Greek word. But here he is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant regarding spirituals. And, and of course, the word gifts is added to our English translation to make it clear to us that he is talking about spiritual gifts. And these gifts are special equipment for ministry that the Holy Spirit gives in some measure to all believers. Now, uh, I'd like to just share this with you because I think it's important. The fact that God gives every single believer a gift or multiple gifts to be used within the body tells us exactly how the body of Christ is to do church. Church is not an entertainment center. We don't have girders on the sides with all sorts of colored lights and then flashing lights and pyrotechnics and then a worship team that covers the whole stage and there's no pulpit because what's important in these churches is the music and that's it. And the guy gets up, does not exegete the passage, but just generally speaks on some topical issue for 15 minutes and then... They sing a couple more songs and then they're done. This is, the church is not entertainment. The church is a gathering of believers to worship God and to edify one another within the things of God. If you don't believe that, go over to Ephesians chapter 4 and read the whole chapter. And so spiritual gifts are given to everybody. Now you're going to say, well, I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Well, hang in there. We'll get to that. I will just say this ahead of time so that you don't get all worried and bothered about it. It's not all that important you know what your spiritual gift, the name of your spiritual gift is. What is important is that you stay open to the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit of God, especially in the area of ministering to one another. That's what's important, how you minister to one another. You don't come in here to just sit in a pew and then that's it. He goes on here to say, and all those 
gifts that are given to us are wholly under the control and used, are to be used for Christ's glory. I like what he says here. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. The particular word that is used here in the Greek is agoneo. We get our English word to agonize from it. What it means is, I don't want you to not know. I don't want you to be agonizing over this. I want to make it perfectly clear what spiritual giftedness is all about. So here's the point. If you will exegete this passage literally and historically, you will have no problem understanding the issue regarding spiritual gifts and all the ancillary issues that revolve around it. So Paul was deeply concerned that those brethren have a proper understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in relations to his gifts in their lives. He apparently believed that some of the Christian, uh, Corinthians' problems were due not entirely to worldly attitudes. 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for you are still carnal, for you were, for where there was envy and strife and division among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? So it wasn't just all of that, but that was a part of it. Also, the presence of false teachers who preyed on their spiritual immaturity and exasperated the problems. And then, of course, their pagan background, out of which many had come, and some are still coming into the church, did not help them to ascertain truth. And when these pagans had that kind of influence, the scripture Paul is saying here, you become led away as you were once before by dumb idols. That's what's going on here. Avoid it. And then the Apostle Paul, this is one of two tests that are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. The other one will be found in verses 20 through 22 of 1 Corinthians 14. But here's the first test that needs to be applied. He says, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, when you first read that passage, you go, what? What is he talking about? Well, look, as I've said before, and this is what this passage is really speaking to, a great test to know whether a certain doctrine is of the Lord or not is to examine it in light of the person and work of Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And he does it with a negative and then a positive. No one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. Now, what is that a reference to? It could have been a reference to maybe some Jews that, have, that were in Corinth that knew the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23, where it says, for he who is hanged is accursed, which is again repeated in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And they may have been trying to sway some within the Corinthian church away from their, uh, their uh, Christocentric view by saying, look, Jesus was crucified. He was accursed. Of course, the Spirit of God would never testify to such a thing. And how can you even believe that cursing the Lord and Savior could be from the Holy Spirit? But there were also some, because of Gnosticism, that was rampant in the Near East. That denied the humanity of Christ. Because why? Because they said anything that was physical was evil. And anything that was spirit was good. 
And since Jesus had a physical body, he is evil, and therefore he is accursed. And the proof of that was they crucified him. That's what he's talking about. And then the second test is, and no one can say that Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now look, anybody, and you're probably sitting there saying, now wait a minute, I don't understand this. It's the same problem we had with the first one. We need to understand the background a little bit. Paul is speaking, of course, of a sincere confession. An unbeliever can easily utter those words. We see that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does my will, does the will of my Father in heaven. So anybody can call him Lord, but the point simply is here, is that only a true believer can claim that Jesus Christ is his Lord. Only a true believer. The title Lord here is the Greek word kyrios. It's also found in Romans 10, verse 9. And the title implies deity as, as opposed to the negative of, verse, of the first half of verse 3, that he wasn't deity, that he was just a man in the flesh and therefore cursed. So confessing Jesus as Lord was always understood as confessing Jesus as God and deity. Now I want to stop there. If you've ever read Charles Ryrie, he makes this argument, and I think very well. But then he concludes that his conclusion is, is that when a person comes to Jesus Christ, according to Romans 10, he is merely testifying that Jesus Christ is God, not Lord. Uh, duh. Look. If Jesus Christ is God, he is the creator of the universe, he is the sovereign of the universe, he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and he demands lordship in your life. End of story. So confessing Jesus as Lord was always understood as confessing Jesus Christ as deity and God, and the Gnostics may have confessed Christ as Lord, but he would not have confessed Jesus as Lord because he had a physical body. And as I just mentioned, Lord implies sovereign authority or lordship. Otherwise, the words of Thomas, my Lord and my God, in John chapter 10, 28, really would have no meaning at all. I want you to think about this, just as a statistical point of reference. The term Lord is used over 700 times in the New Testament. The word Savior is used 10 times. Now, uh, let me make this clear. If the word Savior was used one time, that's enough. If the word Lord is used one time, that's enough. But here is the point that I'm trying to drive home. If Jesus is our Savior, he is clearly our Lord 700 times over. The Lordship and deity and sovereignty of Jesus Christ is essential to our true faith. And such an affirmation, then, is a work of the Spirit of God. Let me give you some concluding statements here that I think will help you. We'll just, I'm just going to run through these because I'm running out of time. I'm out of time. The Corinthians had come to judge the nature and use of gifts based on experience rather than the content of Scripture. The more impressive, the more showy, the more unusual, and the more bizarre, the more they accepted and respected those things. As long as it took place in the church and was presented by someone who claimed to be a Christian, any teaching or practice was accepted without question. 
Well, it's going on in the church. That should be proof enough. There are a lot of things that go on in the church that aren't biblical. The point is, is that content and sound doctrine were being ignored. Experience trumped everything and left the Corinthians open to deceit, even blasphemy and immorality. In other words, they were, as John MacArthur in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 says, practicing strange fire. Let me read the passage out of Leviticus to Nadab and Abihu. The sons of Aaron each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered a profane fire. King James translates that strange fire. Before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Serious things. True spiritual gifts used in the body of Christ, especially in worship, are for the edification of believers. Chapter 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm and has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edification. And then secondly, and most importantly, True spiritual gifts used in the body of Christ are to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And here's one that I like to end with. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks... Let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you lack discernment, Let me give you two things you should do. Flee anything that is not grounded in the word. And secondly, spend considerably more time in the word than you already are. So that you will have a spirit of discernment. That's what you need to do. And discipline yourself to a literal historical interpretation of the word of God. Ground yourself in the content of the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we've had here together. I'd ask, Lord, that you would remind us of how important it really is for us to be grounded in your word. And that we are to flee anything that would add to or subtract from the word of God. And especially here, Lord, regarding spiritual giftedness, where ecstasies and ecstatic expressions seem to take precedence over the Word of God. Lord, remind us that it is your Word, and it is of no private interpretation, as Peter claims, and it is to be understood We are to be diligent in your word, we pray in Christ's name, amen.